Okay, let's get going. Uh, welcome to the final session of CPAIOR. And of course, they saved the best for last. So this is the timetabling session. So just as a reminder, we've got some uh, longer talks uh, for which we have 12-minute uh, presentations, three minutes Q&A. We've got one short talk uh, where there will not be Q&A, uh, but there will be the opportunity to chat with people after the closing session. So uh, why don't we begin, get started? Our very first talk is on minimal perturbation in university timetabling with maximum satisfiability. And I'm gonna tell you, this is a really interesting talk because I think everybody's timetable has had to change multiple times over the last few months. So uh, why don't we get started? Uh, Alexandra, I assume you are the one speaking today. Greetings, I'm Alexandra Lemons and I'm here to talk to you about a paper entitled Minimal Perturbation in University Time Table with Maximum Satisfiability. This is joint work with my supervisor, Phil Montel and Ine Ruiz. First, let's start with a brief outline of the presentation. We will start by motivating you to the topic at hand. Then we will discuss different types of disruptions that occur in universities. Then we will give you a brief description of the international timetabling competition for which the solution discussed in this talk has participated in. Then we will discuss the solution architecture that has a strong processing background and uses a max and solver. Then we will discuss the results. And finally, we end the talk with some concluding remarks. So everything starts with a problem, and then we find the solution. However, as time goes by, the problem changes, and we need to reassess the solution. However, the validity of the solution may no longer be valid. And so the goal of this work is to make this process automatic. So at IST, it's still handmade. Now let's consider a timetable with four time slots, three rooms, and four classes. Now imagine that room two has to close down due to COVID contamination. So we will need to change the assignment of class two and three. Hypothesis one is to change class two to room three and class three to room one. This has a hamming distance of two. The hamming distance is the distance between the original solution and the new found solution. As only two classes change assignments, the hamming distance is two. Now let's consider that the timetable has a soft constraint relating to the precedence or order of the classes. So class one has to be taught before class two and class two has to be taught before class three and so on. The original solution has cost zero as this constraint holds. However, the first hypothesis has cost one as this constraint does not hold. However, there's another hypothesis with the same hemming distance, so only two changes, where you change class two to room one and class three to room three. The hemming distance is still two and the cost is zero, as the precedence constraint holds. So there's a study published in the Journal of Scheduling that analyzes the five years of disruption at IST. So we can see that changes in curriculum during this period were rare, and changes in overlap constraints and number of lectures are not that important. The most important uh, disruption is the modifying enrollments, that can be explained by the fact that students change their enrollments frequently as they can choose their own elective courses. And that normally changes year after year. The two, major, the two other major disruptions are changes in time assignments and room assignments. Uh, please note that this study is before COVID, so these numbers are likely to grow. For example, room assignments will probably increase due to COVID contamination of rooms, as we discussed in the example above. And the room assignments and modifying enrollments probably will increase with the reduction of room capacity due to social distancing rules. So the international timetable in competition has 13 instances from 12 universities, five continents and nine countries. You can see the flags up there. The problem is characterized by a set of courses with different configuration of classes, a set of rooms with an availability periods and travel durations between them a set of students with a set of courses they must take. Each class is characterized by a set of constraints, a set of possible room and time assignments, a length and a limit capacity for the students that can attend. Please note that all rooms in the domain of class have enough capacity to seat all students. So the objective here is to assign to each class a time and a room, to section students into classes, and to optimize all soft constraints including travel restrictions between rooms. 
a solution presented in this paper uh, finished among the top five of the international timetabling competition. So, the solution per se. It has a problem instance, a set of disruptions, and the original solution, and we feed it to a Maxal solver. However, it's not that simple. We need to preprocess the instance. So, we have two preprocessing techniques. One is to create sub instances, and the other is to merge students. So, let's dive into the preprocessing techniques. The first one is to create sub instances. We want to create self contained sub instances that can be solved independently. So, in order to achieve that, we need four things. One is to ensure that the set of courses between two sub instances are dejoint. That goes as the same for rooms and students. The sets must be dejoint between two sub instances. However, this is not enough. We need to ensure that one class, two classes from two different instances do not have any constraint between them. So the constraints must relate only to classes of the same instance and this way we can solve them independently. So the other preprocessing technique is to merge students. We want to create clusters of students as large as possible that have the exactly the same curriculum plan. Here we have an example where course one has only one class with a limit of four students. Course two has two classes, two and three. Both classes have a limit of one student. In this short example, we could consider uh, these four students as independent. However, in larger uh, instances, this wouldn't be practical. So we could consider to merge all students into one big cluster. However, as we can see, S1 and S2 have a different curriculum plan as S3 and S4. As S1 and S2 must attend course one and two, and S3 and S4 only need to attend course one. So we can split this into clusters. However, this is not enough. The green cluster is fine. S3 and S4 have exactly the same curriculum plan. However, S1 and S2, even though they have exactly the same curriculum plan, this cluster is not enough. As class two has a limit of one, and class three has a limit of one. So a cluster of two will not be good for sectioning. We need to split them into a red and blue cluster. So we need three clusters to solve this small example. So the max not encoding, we have five decision variables, all Boolean. Three of them are relating to time assignments, one for week, day, and hour. Another one is relating to assignment of a class to a specific group. And the last one is relating to the student section portion of the problem that relates the assignment of a cluster of students to a specific class. So a few examples of constraints. Most of the constraints in this encoding are binary clauses. Here we have an example of two classes that cannot be taught in the same time slot. This shows us the advantage of having separate variables for the time assignment, as we don't need to consider weeks or days for a constraint relating to time, to the starting time of a class. So this redu reduces the number of constraints needed. We also need exactly one constraint. Here we have an example of class C that can only have exactly one uh, room assigned to it. We will need uh, exactly one constraint for all decision variables. Uh, we also have another type of constraint that at most k. Here we have an example of a max day load constraint that ensures that all classes in the day, their duration is smaller than k. Please note this is a small example of the number of constraints in the international timetable competition. There are 19 different constraints, all explained in the paper. So the results. We run everything with a time limit of 6,000 seconds. More of that is unnecessary as the solution stops improving after that. We use the TT OpenWBO Inc. SAT software that won the weighted incomplete track of the MaxSAT evaluation of this year. At the time of the submission of this paper, we only solved 20 out of 13 instances. The value increased, fortunately. The quality of these instances are in the same order of magnitude as the best known solutions today. The simulated annealing approach only solves 16 out of 13 instances. This is an approach by Anand Gashi that also finished in the top five of the competition. Uh, it's the only other open source solution that we could compare it with. So here we can see at the right a graph that shows the normalized cost of each instance over the time and the black box show when the solver found the best solution for the specific instance. In this case, we can know that uh, at 1000 mark, we already found the best solution for seven instances. So this instance will not improve over time. 
at the 2000 mark we have 15 instances with the best known solution and only five of them will improve over the 2000 mark so now let's consider disruptions we in this work we only consider invalid time and invalid room disruptions as the other big disruption is the modifying of enrollments however in this data set all student conflicts are solved so a change in enrollment will not cause uh, a change a significant change in the solution the solution will continue to be feasible here in this graph we have the time per instance the instances are organized by university and we can see in most of them the original solutions takes longer to solve than the disrupted instances this is explained by the fact we warm start the solver with the original solution so if we need to do less perturbations to return to normality after a disruption the instance will be uh, easier to solve however if we need to do many disruption many perturbations to recover from a disruption so the warm start solution is uh, wrong or further from the correct answer the time will increase we can see the exceptions to these rules are these instances where the execution time takes longer to solve the disrupted instances and this can be explained by the fact they have more perturbations because the domain is smaller here we can see a graph that shows the average room domain of a class and the hemming distance and we can see when we have smaller domains we will need to do more perturbations to return to normality and so we will spend more time see so we also compared our model with an integral linear programming model the main difference of this model is that it uses an integral variable for the starting time of a, a class it actually solves the minimal perturbation problem with the same criteria however this solution only solves 10 out of 13 instances but please bear in mind it was created for easier benchmarks. Interestingly enough, most instances exceed the memory limit, uh, and those that don't exceed the memory limit are 1.6 times slower to find the solution than the Maxat solve. This is, can be probably explained by the fact that binary clauses are really, really optimized for SAT solvers and not so much for integral programming solvers. So the takeaway message is that now more than ever it's important to solve minimal perturbation problems due to COVID and that complex university timetabling problems can be efficiently solved and encoded in MaxSat. However, it's really important to have preprocessing techniques to achieve good results in good times. As follow-up, we propose to reduce the search space by solving the problem incrementally. So in each iteration, we increase the domain option of each class this uh, follow-up work actually was already completed during the delay in the conference and we now can probably say that we can solve all instances of the competition within the time limit however this can be even improved further improved with using of unsat cores to increase the domain when needed uh, in terms of minimal perturbation, we could explore the incremental nature of the problem to avoid repetitions during the search. I hope everything was clear. Thank you. I'm available for questions. And here are the references. Thank you. Thank you very much. I uh, all right, we have time for about one question. Anybody uh, want to add something to this? If not, let's give a, a virtual applause. Thank you very much. And we will move on to the second talk. Uh, we will move from course timetabling to exam timetabling. Welcome everyone, this is Andrea Scher from the University of Udine. My talk is about local search and constraint programming for real-world examination timetable problem. It's a joint work with Michele Battistutta, Fabio De Cesco and Darina Topan from uh, an optimization company, Sistat, and Sara Cesca and Luca Di Gaspero from my university. 
Okay, so this is the outline of the talk. So we start with the problem formulation, then the solution techniques, then we show the instances that we have collected, then we go to the experimental analysis, and then we draw uh, some conclusions. So, uh, this is a quite specific problem that applies to uh, Italian universities that have some peculiar structure with respect to the ones known in the timetable literature. Uh, so, I will start introducing it with an example. Uh, one of the peculiarities is that exams are given more than once uh, in one uh, uh, examination session. So, for example, here a database is given twice. Uh, and you have a certain distance between the two uh, times that the, uh, exam is, that the exam is given. Uh, for example, here we, this uh, uh, exam is given only once, and so there is no distance. The sum can uh, have different uh, examination types, so it can be uh, written, oral, or written and oral. Uh, in case of written and oral, uh, this should be given in this strict order, and there is a minimum and maximum distance uh, between the two parts. And then uh, there are uh, requests uh, mainly for the uh, written part, but can also be requests for the oral part. For example, this exam asks for one um, small uh, room for the written part and one any room for the oral part. Normally, uh, written parts uh, require large instances, large rooms. Uh, so these are the rooms, uh, large and small. And then we have uh, curricula. So this is a curriculum-based uh, formulation. Uh, for example, uh, man management engineering has uh, two uh, primary courses and one secondary course. Uh, primary courses are those which are taken by all the students, so there will be more students uh, showing up at the exam, and secondary ones are taken only by part of the students. Okay, so uh, when we want to find the solution, we have to explode the courses into single events. So, for example, the database has four events because uh, uh, it has two exams, uh, each one composed by two parts. Uh, others have uh, uh, other uh, combinations. So this is a solution. So, uh, for example, uh, the written part of the first exam of database is, is given in period number two, and it's assigned rooms A and B. So, each uh, the, uh, the room and the can be either nothing, which we call the dummy room, or a single room, or uh, a set of rooms. Okay, so now let's uh, go in more in detail into hardness of constraints. So, uh, obviously, the first one is that uh, the room request should be of the correct type and number, that the two rooms cannot be occupied uh, by two exams in the same period. Then we have the art conflicts between uh, events. So, if they are in the same curriculum and they're both primary, so there is, a, there is an art conflict, if they have the same teacher. And then we have uh, precedences, so uh, pa uh, events uh, uh, belonging to the same course have a strict order, so the uh, written is before the oral, and the oral is before the written of the next exam, and so on. Uh, and then we have some uh, unavailabilities. Let's go to the uh, soft constraints. So we have soft conflicts. So if they are in the same curriculum, but they are either primary, secondary, or secondary, secondary, and then we have preferences, soft preferences, so we can say it's not mandatory, but I would prefer not to be in that room, not to be in that period, and so on. Then there are distances between events, so if they are in the same exam, as we said, there is minimum and maximum distance. If they are in the same course between exams, there is, there is uh, also here uh, a maximum and uh, minimum distance. And then if they belong to the same curriculum, there are also distances. In this case, it's an uh, uh, undirected instance because it can be in any order, just we want to have some separation for giving rest to the students. Okay, there are many features that we have kept out because the full problem uh, has other features. So with the one that we have, we can cap capture only some of the uh, uh, instances that we, in some of the universities that we have dealt with. And there, are, there is a group of other uh, features that we, uh, for the time being, we have uh, neglected. Uh, <clears throat> okay, let's go to the solution techniques. So we are using uh, simultaneity, which is a local search technique. So we start with the basic features of local search. So first, the search space, the space is a typical one. There are two vectors. One is uh, uh, the, the period assigned to an event. And the second one is the room set, which can be, as I said, uh, the dummy room or a, or a single room or a combination of rooms. 
and these two constraints are always satisfied, uh, whereas the others are included in the cost function. So the cost function is a combination of three R constraints plus all the soft ones. Obviously, the R constraints are given a larger uh, weight. The initial solution is totally random. The neighbors, uh, the first one is moving one event. So this is standard classical neighborhood of this type of problem. So change the period and the room set of a single event. But for the peculiarity of our problem, we have a second neighborhood, which is move an exam. So we move together a written and oral part uh, uh, of the same uh, length uh, of the movement. Okay, so we use simulated annealing. So this is the classical version of simulated annealing, one you see in the original papers. Uh, so we have a, a geometric cooling and metropolis acceptance criterion and so on. Uh, the only uh, change that we make is that we use also what is called the cutoff mechanism in which the temperature is lower not only when it reaches a certain number of, uh, of samples but also when it reaches a certain number of accepted uh, moves. Okay, so these are the, the, the changes that we made from the standard uh, version to accommodate this uh, cutoff mechanism. Okay, for constraint programming we use MiniZinc, so we, we wrote the MiniZinc model. So in order to use MiniZinc we have to pre-process the input files. So the input files uh, consider courses and exams, whereas uh, these are pre-processed, -pre uh, uh, flattening it into single events. So also distances between events are made explicit in the pre-processed uh, uh, data zinc file. And then the variables are the same as in uh, uh, for local search. So we have a vector of periods assigned to events and a vector of locations assigned to events. Uh, so we don't show all the full model uh, for, uh, for brevity, so I'll just give some examples. So this is a constraint for room occupation. This is a disjunctive constraint that means that for every uh, pair of exams, either the period is different or the location is different. Where the location is this, uh, different, given that we have uh, sets of uh, rooms, is that the two sets assigned to the two rooms do not overlap. Notice that the dummy room does not overlap even with itself, so it means that we can accommodate more um, uh, more exams, more events in the same uh, in the dummy room in, at the same time. Okay, this is a, an example of a source constraint. So we have the conflict cost, uh, the definition of a variable conflict cost, which is the sum of the uh, violations when, uh, let's say, two exams have the, uh, are assigned to the same period. Okay, so do, uh, we collected uh, instances, so we collected seven, seven departments belonging to six universities. We, uh, we collect from one or two academic years and three sessions uh, per year. Files are in uh, JSON format and also in MiniZinc format, as I said, and they will be soon available on our uh, repository, which is at this, uh, um, at this uh, uh, link. Uh, the repository normally has uh, instances, solutions, and online validator, and we will put it there, everything there. Okay, so we have uh, uh, these seven departments, these are the features, so we have uh, courses, events, and periods, and rooms. You see, for example, one department doesn't have, uh, does have has zero rooms, means that just that the, the, man the management decided to do not uh, uh, use the software for the rooms, but they assign rooms uh, by themselves. This is the number of slots per day, so this is also different. Ma many of them have two slots per day, uh, morning and afternoon, others have more slots per day. Okay, so uh, let's see the, the results. So first we do, we talk about the tuning. So we use fixed number of iterations for the simulated annealing. We have parameters, we made small changes in the parameter. Uh, I don't have time to go into the details for explaining this parameter. We use as, a, as the sign of experiment. So the points in the parameter space, we use the Amersley point set. And we use F-rays for uh, comparing configurations, comparing Amersley points. And we use the Friedman rank test sum to uh, separate, uh, which is done in, in internally in uh, F rays. And um, uh, everything is embedded into the software tool, which is called JSON to run, that's, that uh, generates Amersley points and uh, runs rays in various, in various cores of the machine. Okay, so let's see the preliminary experiment. For, for um, uh, department one, which is a, a typical one, Simedalin re returns quite good results, which are quite stable. You see averages and bests are very similar. 
uh, mini zinc was not able to solve it. So uh, this means this cross means that uh, the system crashed, uh, our exhausted memory, whereas the uh, dash means that uh, uh, couldn't return any solution. For the department tool, there is a peculiar, a peculiar uh, situation in which uh, Sumida Leaning is unable to get to the optimal solution, but is stuck in this solution of larger cost, which is found every time. Uh, and two, uh, two, two engines were able to find optimal solutions in two or three uh, cases. Uh, here, these are quite easy instances. We see also some of the engines were able to find uh, the optimal solution. For some instances, even though Simulaline still finds cost zero, the engines do not find uh, a solution except for G code, but which finds a, an incredibly high cost. Here, for these two uh, departments, uh, we see it's re it's results of similar are not that good in some cases. For example, here, the average is much higher than the best, so this means that there are rooms for improvement. Okay, similar results here. Uh, so let's go to the uh, conclusions. So, uh, first of all, we can see that the straightforward uh, CP does not work. It works only in very simple cases, uh, so there is room for improvement. Simulaneri works well in most cases, but definitely not all of them. Okay, so we have seen two cases in which we, there are clues that we can improve. So how do we plan to improve? Obviously, first of all, we want to add the missing feature because we want to build a, a software, a full a commercial software that could be used in practice by the universities. So we really want to have the features to, to be able to solve as many universities as possible. We want to explore new neighborhoods because we see that, for example, in the case in which we was not able to find the optimal solution, probably there are some uh, more complex movement that could uh, solve the, the problem. Um, we need smarter uh, mini zinc encodings because the standard one, the straightforward one, does not work, or maybe some annotations, so we, uh, there is room for improvement in that side. Um, and we want, as I said, to use it in production. We want really to collect more instances and to uh, solve the real problems of the university. And here, for the time being, we are only in the, in the, in the testing phase. No, we're not, you, we have not used it in practice. Okay, thank you for your attention. This is the end of my talk. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you. Uh, we have time for a couple questions. Uh, we have a couple in chat. Uh, so from Neil, did you try MiniZinc with an existing constraint-based local search solver? Uh, okay, this is easy because the answer, unfortunately, is no. So we, we plan to do it. So we really, we really want to do it. But uh, I, have a, I have the answer for the second question. So I, so I don't feel. Can we move ahead to the second question? <laughs> Uh, actually, we uh, in the time being after the conflict, we uh, try to use uh, Cplex directly. Uh, no, not not Cplex inside MiniZinc, and it works. It worked much better. So still not at the level of simulated annealing. And we also try to hybridize Cplex, so EP with uh, with uh, simulated annealing. So the question is, did, if you plan to hybridize simulated annealing with CP, we didn't do that, but we did something similar. We hybridized simulated annealing with EP in the sense that we use similar leading for a uh, warm starting EP. But so far, we didn't have any good uh, solution. So the warm start idea of uh, integer programming, in my experience so far, in our experience so far, is not working. So uh, let's say um, so far, no, no, no results in that respect. OK, thank you. Uh, time for one more question. Uh, so, can you say something about the space complexity or memory usage for the CP models? And did it depend on the back end solver from Emmanuel? Uh, actually, I'm, I really, I'm really using them as a black box, so I can't tell you much. So, I'm not an expert of MiniZinc, so uh, I, I'm saying I'm more an expert of uh, Simultanini. I can say that for the local search, the memory uh, complexity is extremely low. I mean, really, you need nothing. You need very, so there is no reason to discuss about it. So the, the memory usage of, uh, of local search is uh, neglectable. For CP, I can tell. I can I can tell you that it's very very high because uh, used to most of the runs t uh, terminated with memory exhaust, exhaust, exhausted. So I can only say that. So 
But as I said, they, probably it's related to the mini zinc uh, encoding. So probably direct uh, G code usage or direct uh, uh, CPLEX usage, it's uh, probably more efficient. So the, this at least this is my experience. Good, thank you. Any other follow-up questions we can do in the session, uh, or in the coffee break right after the closing session. So we move from uh, examination timetabling uh, to a problem very close to my heart, and that is the sports scheduling problem of the traveling tournament problem. Welcome to this short talk about approaching the traveling tournament problem with randomized beam search. I'm Nicholas Warner. This is a joint work with uh, Bernard Norman, Julia Pache, and Günther Heidi. The traveling tournament problem has been introduced by Easton Amos and Trick in 2001. It's about uh, sports league scheduling. The goal is uh, uh, we are given n teams and a distance function d. And we need to schedule a double round robin tournament where every team plays against each other team twice, once at home and once away, uh, so that we minimize the total travel distance for all teams with the assumption that every team starts and uh, ends at its home venue and goes directly from the venue in the current round to the venue in the next round. Two constraints are added, the no repeat constraint and the at most constraint, the latter uh, limits the number of consecutive away in consecutive home games to, to you, most of the time in literature this is three. Yes. So the state of the arts. This is an MP hard problem and is also form, famous for its empirical hardness. In our opinion, the go-to approaches are at the moment DFS star, iterative deepening A star, research-based methods by Uthus and others. And on the heuristic side, uh, still uh, the simulated any link based approaches by Anonymous Topolas et al. The author of our heuristic approach is uh, that we start from a state space formulation to construct solutions and we traverse this uh, state graph and layer wise. And in each layer, we only keep the, the beta uh, most promising nodes. This is then called the beam search. And we guide this beam search by uh, the, the uh, well-known independent law bounds derived from, from a given state. Then on the implementation side, we make use of a memory-limited beam search variant to go for really high beam widths. And to diversify and parallelize, we add some randomization, as we'll see later. So again, the beam search sorts the nodes in, in each layer, the states in each layer, according to some f value known from A star. And then when, it's, when, when we hit the terminal node, it's also possible to run into dead ends, um, then we have found a feasible solution. So how do we randomize and parallelize here? Uh, first of all, we uh, shuffle the teams. So in the, in the state space formulation, we have to break symmetry and, and set uh, team ordering. And this we just simply randomize here. And also we add to this F value some Gaussian noise parameterized by some uh, variance, relative variance value uh, derived from the root uh, state estimate uh, here to get the orders of magnitude right. So independent lower bounds are already introduced in the, in the initial paper by Easton and others, and then uh, explicitly stated for, for states by Euthus and others. So that the key is that we have to, that we are given a, a capacitated vehicle routing problem that we have to solve, given some states that depends also on the away games, the streak, position, etc. And we, have, we uh, have two options here to solve this either exactly or approximately. We compare this later in the, in the study. So appro approximately this we do on the fly using Google R tools and cache the result because there's much uh, reuse going on. And exactly for this, we uh, make use of a recursive constraint shortest path problem on another state graph and then cache this in some lookup table. The study is performed uh, in single thread mode on, on a given processor with a generous memory. 
And we've implemented our approach in an efficient Julia 1.4 implementation, also published it on GitHub. We make use of Google R2 7.5 and we test on the classic and for classical benchmark sets and NFL Circ and Galaxy starting from 12 up to 24 teams. And we run 30 multiple runs in a parallel randomized beam search with some gentle noise added to each uh, node heuristic value. What are the results? We compare uh, with the best uh, found solutions as reported in the literature and on market fix webpage. Um, and we compared a relative gap difference between the literature and our best found results. So when we use this exact guidance, solving the CVRPs exactly with a beam width of 200,000, then we get this mean minimum relative gap difference of slightly below 1% and the runtime for 16 teams instance exemplary uh, of 11 hours. The approximate guidance has a slightly worse relative gap difference, 1.67%, but still uh, comparable, competitive, and the mean runtime of, of a little bit higher, of 14.7 hours. Interesting, we do find new best feasible solutions, uh, two for the CERC in instances and four for the Galaxy instances. Still, we conclude that population-based modeling uh, remains the state-of-the-art on the heuristic side, and we, uh, for further work uh, is concerned with uh, introducing a learning approach for the guidance to, to make better use of these multiple run, runs and learn something from the runs uh, to feed back into, the, into a guidance function. Thanks for your attention, and I'm looking forward to your questions in the Q&A session afterwards. Thank you very much. So any questions can be done at the Q&A after the coffee break. And in our final talk, we're gonna bring in the students when it comes to timetabling and their preferences. This presentation provides a summary of techniques to optimize student course preferences in school timetabling. And this talk was designed for presentation at the 17th International Conference on the integration of constraint programming, artificial intelligence, and operations research in September 2020. I became passionate about timetabling during my undergraduate degree at Quest University Canada, a 600 student liberal arts and sciences university where every student self designs their academic curriculum, enrolling in a unique set of courses from all departments. I just graduated from Quest University in April 2020. And for my undergraduate honor thesis, I designed the optimal timetable for an all girls high school in Canada called St. Margaret School. My name is Irene Fabris, and as the co-author of the paper titled Optimizing Student Course Preferences in School Timetabling, I'm delighted to present you the algorithm we applied at St. Margaret. Similarly to Quest University, St. Margaret needed a timetable that accommodates all self-designed interdisciplinary schedules of each student at the school. We provided and implemented the probably optimal timetable, and in this talk, I'll explain you how we built it. We conceived a two-stage algorithm that first finds an optimal coloring of a weighted conflict graph for single section courses. And then it solves an integer linear program or ILP for short to generate the final timetable. Every year, St. Margaret runs a weekly schedule comprising of nine blocks, where blocks are simply the time slots during which courses take place. For example, a block can run from eight to nine in the morning or nine to 10 and so on. Our goal was to construct the optimal senior timetable that allocates courses to the nine pre-established blocks as shown in the slide. Here, course names are followed by the student grade, 11 or 12, and by the teacher's initials, which appear in parentheses. Some courses are sought by many students, and so multiple sections of the course are offered. This is why some courses appear twice in the timetable, such as Culinary Arts 11A and 11B. The rest are specialized courses that attract only a small number of students, 
and so only a single section appears. We designed a timetable using an ILP whose variables follow. Let x tcb be the binary variable that equals 1 if teacher t is assigned to course c in block b and it equals 0 otherwise. Similarly, let y scb equal 1 if student s takes course c in block b and let y equal 0 otherwise. Every teacher may or may not be qualified to teach a course, while students may or may not wish to enroll in a course. Our ILP model must account for this in the following way. For every teacher course block triplet, TCB, as well as for each student course block triplet, SCB, we multiply the binary variables X and Y by a desirability coefficient and a preference coefficient, respectively. It follows that the larger is D, the stronger the willingness to teach a course, and the larger the P, the stronger the preference to enroll in a course, obviously. By adding the variables X and Y, we find that our ILP aims to maximize the objective function shown on the screen, where the summation is computed over the sets T, S, C, and B. There are the sets of teacher, students, course, and blocks, respectively. The objective function is subject to a total of eight hard constraints. These are assign at most one teacher to a class in a block and assign at most one course section in any given block. Define O to be the number of offered section of course C, then offer exactly O many sections for course C. No student can enroll in multiple courses in the same block and no student can take the same course section twice. Enroll a student in a course only if that course is offered in that block. Don't schedule more courses than there are rooms available. And lastly, let MC be the maximum class size for course C. Then courses cannot exceed the maximum class size. Now, a course timetable in problem can be solved by the above ILP guaranteeing an optimal solution whenever T, S, and C are of reasonable size, such as St. Margaret's model that has a total of just over 27,000 binary decision variables. However, when the problem size is larger, like in most universities, simplifications are required to ensure tractability. This provides the epistemological justification for bundling. Course bundling comprises of three steps. Step one, construct a weighted conflict graph. Of the 31 section courses, some are short courses scheduled in blocks one, two, and three, with two weekly classes. And the remaining courses are long, offered in blocks four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine with three weekly classes. Now construct the conflict graph as follow. Let C be the set of courses. C is equal to the union of multiple section courses, CM, and one section courses, CO. Consider CO and let it be the set of vertices of a weighted conflict graph called G. Now, Let's assign a weight to the edges of G. For each pair, X and Y and CO, the edge weight W of X and Y is WT, WR, WS, where W stand for some arbitrary integers indicating scheduling conflicts for teachers, rooms, and students respectively. Now, for St. Margaret, graph G has 30 vertices because there are 30 one-section courses offered at the school. We created the conflict graph by drawing an edge that is a conflict for each student S desiring to take both, for example, C12 drama and C61 active living. Accounting for all student teacher and room conflicts yields the conflict graph G0 with 30 vertices and 94 edges. Step two, find a graph coloring. For each non-negative integer I, let gi be the graph whose vertices are co and whose edges have weight greater than i. One can think of it this way. The bigger the integer i, the lower the density of graph gi. Now, recall that for each gi, the chromatic number chi of gi is the fewest number of colors needed to color the vertices of gi so that no pair of vertices joined by an edge share the same color. Thus, if we find 
a graph coloring for G, whose chromatic number is at most B, then we could bundle those one section courses in the same color class together and assign them to the same block in our optimal timetable. How can I do so? Well, starting with i equal to zero, calculate chi of gi. If chi of gi is at most b, then stop. Otherwise, increment i by one until we find some index i equals to t for which chi of gt is at most b. Visually, start from graph g0. Notice that g0 is a true component graph because short courses that ought to be scheduled in blocks one, two, and three are disjoint from long courses that ought to be scheduled in blocks four through nine. Our program determined that the chromatic number of G0 is five plus seven, which is 12, which is greater than nine, the total number of blocks available. So let G1 be the same graph as G0, except we only include edges with weight greater than one. Then G1 becomes a graph with 30 vertices and 69 edges, whose chromatic number is three plus six, which is exactly nine. This is a satisfactory coloring. Step three. These course bundles become the input we feed into our ILP. Once we have found a B coloring of GI, for each bundle, let XJ be the set of courses in CO assigned to color J. Now, redefine the set C to be equal to the union of CM, X1, X2, all the way to XB, where X1 and X2 and so on are color-coded bundles of one section courses, which we can compatibly allocate to the same block in our optimal schedule. To account for the bundling, we added a ninth constraint to the ILP. That is, for every pair of courses C1 and C2 in the same bundle, we equated the binary variable X of C1 to the X of C2 for all blocks, thus ensuring that courses C1 and C2 are assigned to the same block in a mess that they are bundled together. We ran the ILP alone in just over three minutes, scoring 2177 points as objective value. We then simulated a thousand trials of the course bundling approach. Each trial executed in about four seconds, scoring 2155 points on average. This is very satisfactory result. Because with a 1% reduction in solution quality, the course bundling approach reduced runtime by 98%, which is a compression ratio of 49 to 1. As such, this approach is especially promising for larger institutions, colleges, and universities. Now, since an IOP is a complete algorithm, which has the advantage of providing certificates of optimality, and since our problem size was small, we implemented at St. Margaret the provably optimal timetable, scoring 2,177 points. This timetable allocates seven short courses to blocks one, two, and three, and four or five long courses to blocks four through nine, resulting in a symmetric and well-balanced timetable. We delivered it in May 2019, implemented it in September, and already in February 2020, the school was so satisfied that they recontracted us to design their 2020 and 2021 master timetable, which we did. We were also contracted by five other independent institutions in British Columbia, and we deployed the course bundling algorithm I just presented you to design their optimal timetables, which are running this present academic year. In conclusion, in this talk, I presented you with a complete algorithm that is an ILP whose tractability we increased through a graph theoretic pre-processing stage and whose strength lies in the fact that it serves particularly well those small interdisciplinary institutions who wish to create timetables that optimize for student course preferences. I thank you for listening to this talk. I thank Quest University Canada who sponsored this research through a student project grant. And lastly, I thank my co-author, Dr. Richard Ushino, who infused me with what has now become a lifelong passion for the field of mathematical optimization. Thank you.
Thank you, Irene. Great talk. Uh, we have 30 seconds for a final, uh, for uh, well, one question, if uh, anyone has something. So uh, did you consider fairness or egalitarian metrics in the end schedules? Can you hear me well? Yes, we can. Excellent. Thank you for the question, Amir. So um, I would say that in part we did for the simple fact that at St. Margaret, um, which is a STEM uh, school, we prioritize assigning um, subjects in the STEM field. So um, science, engineering, mathematics, and so on to uh, students. And therefore uh, the 17 students, uh, which are that, per, um, the number of students, that percentage that wasn't assigned their uh, first preference were actually not assigned um, quote unquote trivial or uh, a social science or not first pick uh, subjects. And therefore, um, in a sense, there has been fairness at least in the priority that we have given to which uh, subjects to grant the students based on request. But we didn't treat um, different requests as uh, more important in a sense. Every student's request was um, had the same weight in our um, content graph. OK, thank you, Irene. And let's give her a virtual round of applause. And that concludes this session. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, if you have any more questions, of course, it will be after the coffee break.